the session today right now is design-based learning. This is a sensational lineup of founders and practitioners and their organizations and teams doing crucial and inspiring work. I'll introduce them all in a moment. The Migration Summit, organized by the Refugee Action Hub, REACT, NAMAL, Karam Foundation, Paper Airplanes, and the MIT Abdul Latif Jamil World Education Lab, JWELL, is a month-long global convening designed to build bridges between diverse communities of displaced learners, universities, companies, nonprofits, NGOs, social enterprises, foundations, philanthropists, researchers, policymakers, employers, and governments, around the key challenges and opportunities for refugee and migrant communities. And of course, all of you joining us. This year, we are exploring the theme of education and workforce development and displacement through virtual events hosted by participating partners around the world. I'm gonna go over a few administrative notes first, and then I'll introduce our panelists and their organizations. The chat uh, function is enabled and can be used to share questions with the panelists, do be mindful of language, show common respect, show good intentions and a spirit of sharing, listening and understanding, but most importantly, participate. We need your questions to make this a dialogue. At the bottom right of the Zoom screen, you should see an icon with the letters uh, CC and a live transcript. Selecting this feature will allow you to read along with the session. The recording of this session will be available later in the week. Thanks to the organizing team, my co-chairs, and the technical and communication experts, and of course, today's panelists, and you, the summit is real because you, the audience, are here. So we're keen to hear from you, uh, get those questions in early, and we'll moderate them along the way. Now on to our participants in the organizations. The MIT Future Heritage Lab, FHM. L is a research and art lab led by Associate Professor Azra Akshamia at the MIT Department of Architecture, operating at the intersection of art, design, and heritage preservation. The lab invents creative responses to conflict and crisis. It develops a new approaches for bottom-up heritage preservation, builds models for collaboration, knowledge exchange, and fragile environments, and develops methods for revitalizing traditional arts and crafts. The lab's goal is to improve lives of communities under threat and to advance transcultural understanding. Also joining us is NewView. NewView provides transformative learning experiences that build students' confidence and give them the skills for future success. NewView students are prepared to deploy their creative skills and experiences, solving real-world problems to thrive in a range of professional fields. New View X is an initiative developed by New View to bring design, creativity, and innovation to K-12 schools and organizations around the world. Using New View's design studio pedagogy and process, students explore real-world topics in a hands-on studio environment, solving complex challenges using creative, critical thinking, and collaboration. On the panel is NewView's founder and chief excitement officer, Saeed Arida, and NewView Karam head of innovation, Ramzi Naja. And finally, we're also joined uh, by Karam Foundation. Joining us is the founder and CEO, Lina Sergi Attar. Karam is a nonprofit org organization dedicated to help people help themselves. As Karam means generosity in Arabic, they seek to restore the dignity and quality of life for people affected by conflict by eliminating barriers to success through innovative education, entrepreneurial development, and community-driven aid. Welcome, welcome all of you. Uh, we're gonna start with brief presentations from their organizations on their, uh, on their work, and then we're gonna go straight into questions and a dialogue with the panelists and you, the audience. Azra, the floor is yours, we get us started. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, just give me a second to start my screen share. Okay. There we go. You see the full screen, right? It's good. Okay. Great. So, um, as uh, 
uh, um, I uh, start this presentation, I wanted to briefly give you an introduction about uh, the lab and who we are and what we do. Uh, this is our building at MIT, and we are part of the Art Culture Technology Program and Department of Architecture. Here you see one of our installations that dealt with the destruction of Palmyra Arch uh, and um, uh, kind of warfare, cultural warfare in um, Syria, but also in other places. Uh, as uh, was previously mentioned, our work is situated at the intersection of art, design, and uh, uh, preservation. But really, what we are doing with this disciplinary background is try to bridge the um, kind of issues that um, concern heritage preservation and the recovery of communities affected by conflict and crisis with the needs of humanitarian relief and, and humanitarian uh, design. So there is a kind of methods uh, from contemporary art, like participatory art, for example, and then um, interrogative critical design that we use to make that connection and insert ourselves in these uh, fragile environments. So over the past uh, six years, we have been working predominantly in Al Azraq refugee camp in Jordan. It is um, a camp that houses predominantly Syrian refugees. Uh, 35,000 people live there, but we have also done some work in Zatari camp, which uh, houses uh, over 90,000 people. So these are really like huge cities, you could say, uh, located in the desert. Often, you know, these kinds of camps are, you know, position and placed to uh, prevent um, interaction with host population, placed in uh, remote locations. There are many violations of human rights, for example, uh, freedom of movement, access to education, access to uh, places of work and uh, different kinds of opportunities for creating livelihood. So there are many problems uh, that people face uh, housing in um, these kinds of camps. I should mention that only 10% of refugees in Jordan are living in refugee camps. The rest actually lives in the cities and we better integrated, but um, one could say that camps also offer a certain form of um, regulation over um, what is provided in terms of education, where it's much more, it's easy to control what is happening outside of camps. Um, so in these places of timelessness and, and desperation, we found incredible moments of inspiration where people are defying idleness and hopelessness of everyday life by drawing inspiration from their own heritage and really teaching us how we should rather think about the humanitarian relief. So see, for example, here, this um, example of a, a invention created by a Syrian man who was collecting you know, different types of soil from different areas of the desert to create this, what looks like a replica of uh, the Palmyra Arch, but it's also reminiscent of some of the cultural heritage uh, surrounding the camp in Jordan. And this image for me is so poignant because it uh, juxtaposes these two ideas of what a shelter is. On the back, you see the uh, ready-made shelters provided by uh, international organization, in this case, UNHCR, a kind of mass-produced, standardized, one-fits-all solution that um, conceives humanitarian aid as a form of um, and, and human needs, as kind of you need a roof above your head and food to survive. And in front is this sort of cultural shelter, something that is uh, talking about other forms of human, essential human needs, like emotional needs, cultural and aesthetic needs. And I think a lot of our work tries to foreground this, uh, um, this form of uh, essential human needs that art and culture are really equally important when people are you know, you know, traumatized uh, after the war and during the war and are going through really difficult situations it is art and culture and education that can help alleviate um, some of the suffering, but also uh, inform future generations. In this camp, we met incredible people like Abu Zuhair, who makes toys out of trash, out of uh, you know insulation materials. 
people who are transforming at the time when there was no electricity, you know, they would create their own um, windmills and, and uh, like transformations of solar uh, chargers and solar lamps into phone chargers, different utilitarian devices like air conditioning to battle the unbearable heat of the desert and uh, you know, lack of insulation of these uh, shelters. But beyond these uh, utilitarian kind of inventions, it was really notable to see how people transform and humanize humanitarian aid by uh, utilizing these so-called core relief items to create a life worth living and livable environments. So see here, for example, these um, wool blankets that are actually you know, given as a core relief item to everyone. Uh, they use them for insulation, but also decoration and creating a welcoming environment, you know, absence of any kind of social space or uh, group space where you can, you know, welcome guests and family members and people from other, um, other places. So through our work, we have been mapping these inventions together with Al Azraq Camp Journal team, and, and we collaborated, and also colleagues from German Jordanian University students and faculty members so um, to you know learn and from these inventions and uh, translate them into pedagogical formats that are aimed on the one hand to inform education globally about design in context of crisis but on the other hand disseminate knowledge in the camp um, of how people you know invent and, and kind of use their own ingenuity and uh, design as, as a sort of survival. So this example is particularly interesting to me, uh, a water fountain that was, was made by Abu Jar, uh, a super inventive man who is just like, <laughs> has a huge array of, of things that he has invented. But this is such a beautiful uh, invention, this, this water fountain that is reminiscent of uh, his home in Syria, but also um, the way it's designed, it's so that he can reuse these water buckets as you know, it's used as a pedestal and then collects water and the shisha is also here as a kind of piping system for water, but then he can distangle the whole thing and then use the shisha as shisha and the buckets as buckets and create other things with it. And then this moment of anticipation for um, uh, other forms of uses. So this work has been documented uh, in the book that we just recently published uh, called Design to Live, Everyday Inventions from a Refugee Camp. And it's a you know, book that has been in the making for five years and more than 70 people worked on it together over several years, um, kind of working across disciplinary and geographical and cultural borders. Everyone was kind of contributing with their own skill and experience. Uh, important part of our work and this book is to also talk about ethics of working with fragile communities and working in these kinds of environments. So we have this kind of parallel project um, that informed the book called Code of Ethics um, or Cultural Interventions in Humanitarian Context, where design practitioners, humanitarian aid workers, refugees themselves share experiences and dilemmas on how difficult it is to work and what kinds of uh, questions need to be considered when working. Past this was very important because, you know, it informed the methods in which we do things. So it was important, for example, not to just import ourselves as this like Western white saviors, but to, you know, uh, see ourselves as uh, a community of um, different skills and capacities and always have a mix of international uh, students and groups, the host community members, and also, uh, of course, community leaders and members of the local uh, refugee population. And another form of um, ethical approach was to consider transgenerational knowledge transfer. So, uh, you know, elders in the camp have a lot to say and a lot of experience and uh, carriers of knowledge and uh, therefore need to be included in the process. Um, 
We also try to bring in different institutions. For example, here you see uh, Kim Benzel from Metropolitan Museum. She's head of the Near Eastern Department there to, you know, these are institutions that actually store cultural heritage from the region and also have interest in activating it, not who, who's the audience of that stuff that they preserve. So what, you know, can the outreach of these museums be connected uh, for the design education in the camp? So some of the outcomes of our work were like this lamp, for example, that is representing um, a preservationist device and an also educational device. It was um, a little lamp that called Light Weaver. It weaves light three-dimensionally. It is made out of trash, you know, locally sourced materials. And uh, we worked on it together, MIT students and engineers um, and designers from the camp to figure out how, you know, it's easy to laser cut this stuff, but how do you actually do it when you have nothing? Um, and when you are, you know, and just have trash and a little bit of light. And um, then we used also trash and cardboards to punch a little holes and with shisha um, tobacco um, sticks to kind of uh, create these patterns. And this again was like looking at cultural heritage and textile traditions, but also calligraphy, what kinds of cultural patterns could be translated into the weaving of light and what stories could be told. This type of um, project was important because uh, it provides, you know, excitement about learning for students who don't see a point in education anymore because they think they will forever live in this camp. And technology and design had that capacity to get them excited. Um, but also, you know, the device allows you to basically transform the shelter from the inside at the time when they are not allowed to touch anything in the um, that is uh, given to them and you see some of the effects of it uh, with the calligraphic inscriptions but also here we finally got it to work okay i will stop here and other stocks i will show examples of other works later but uh, i think i gave some summary of what we are doing and i will look forward to the conversation thank you Thank you, Azra. Saeed, do you want to introduce us to the view and uh, the partnership with Karam? Yes. Thank you, Azra. It's always amazing to see the work. Uh, so we're going to be talking about Anubu and then transitioning to, to Karam from there. So let me share my screen. Uh, so a quick brief about the the, the history of uh, of Nubu. So so everybody would would have a uh, uh, kind of more knowledge about the, the arc of the, the the evolution of the organization as we as we talk about uh, Karam in a little bit. Uh, so I did my PhD at at MIT in the architecture school, and a big part of the work that I was doing was researching the studio. Uh, the, the the studio pedagogy and how that can uh, inform uh, the education of, of uh, architecture students uh, and for people who are not too familiar with the with the architecture studio uh, it, it's a it, it's a context of learning in which the students are giving a brief uh, uh, of a problem to solve and they go through this very messy process uh, to to get to a solution at the end and for people who are not familiar with this process, it can be daunting and, and, and overwhelming. And so a lot of the research uh, that uh, I have done uh, with, with others was around codifying some of these steps and understanding them and, and create some more understanding how, about how the, the, the studio is taught. So after doing all of that research, um, I wanted to do a, a pilot study with a private school that ended up turning into, uh, into the school. Uh, and the reason why we, we wanted to kind of take that model and embed it in a, in a high school setting, uh, because we thought this, this model is gonna, is gonna be very 
highly engaging because it's hands-on and personal and it teaches students how to problem solve. Uh, the collaborative piece uh, was something that was added into the studio because architecture studios uh, tend to be very insular and every student is, is working on their own projects. So we, we tried a lot of different uh, formats that would allow students to, to, to work uh, together and, and problem solve together. But I think the big part for us that the thing that we wanted to focus on in, in a high school setting is, is how to build that creative confidence with the students. Uh, for people who are not uh, exposed to, 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 to this method of, of learning, if they were given a problem, uh, it would be hard for them to kind of understand how to take that problem and, and, and to break it down into different pieces and come up with seeds of ideas and, and evolve them and all of that. And, and so for us, a big part of taking the students through that, this, this type of learning was to build that confidence that would allow them to look at any problem, even a problem that they don't have a lot of experience with, take that problem and, and, and uh, engage with it in a, in a very kind of meaningful way to come up with, with the, a solution at the end. And so uh, I took a lot of the learnings that I got out of, 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 of that research and uh, we started uh, a studio-based school in, in Cambridge in 2010. And the experimentation continued to kind of figure out what, what is really the best way to build a studio-based uh, uh, school. We are located in Central Square, so we remain very close to, uh, to MIT. And as, if you see the space, it, it's, it has some of those elements of an architecture studio that's very open and uh, students are working on physical things and building and talking. So you can really, the minute, I mean, to this day, it's still like the minute you go into the space, you feel kind of the creative uh, energy uh, of, the, of the students. Uh, this is also, we feel like this is always kind of work in progress, but uh, as you can see, the school is, is uh, mostly based on the studio model. So almost 80% of the curriculum revolves around that. We still have to do some work around supplementary uh, supplementary courses, but, but really the focus of the school on is on the studio. So the students spend four years, and they graduate uh, uh, with with a with a high school diploma, and then they either go to college and uh, or go to the workplace. Uh, and part of the of that school. Uh, of the work that we did on the school, there was a lot of experimentation on the pedagogy, but also a lot of experimentation on tools that would allow us to kind of uh, um, scaffold that experience. So especially for students who are just starting to do this, how can we uh, simplify the process and, and kind of increase complexity as, as the students uh, uh, do more studios. So a big part of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the work that we've done was centered around this studio management system. So this is an alternative to a course management system in which the, the students daily document their work and, and the teachers are able to kind of share resources, give critiques and, and uh, uh, evaluate the students' work. And, and uh, you know, the shift obviously towards the studio-based curriculum too puts a lot of the emphasis on, on the students' work. Uh, and not on, on grades uh, like a traditional school. So a big part of the platform was, you know, to document the work daily, but also allow the students to kind of uh, naturally as they work on the project to have a portfolio at, at the end of every experience. And that portfolio ends up being shared either with, with the jobs that they are applying to or, uh, or universities that they want to go to. We've done a lot of work also on assessment and, and I feel like that can be a whole separate uh, uh, lecture, but it's, this is kind of always an evolving thing. How do you capture the learning of the students in a way that really makes sense and, and capture kind of the depth and the width of, of, of all of the uh, all of that work that they are doing? And so in 2016, because of a lot of the interest that we got from, from different uh, schools and organizations who come and visit us in Cambridge, uh, because of that interest, we, we, we were looking into different ways of how we can scale up and, and uh, uh, create impact outside of the school that we have. And this is when, when this idea of Nuvo X was born. And, and the whole idea of it is to work with schools and organizations on embedding uh, this studio-based learning inside, uh, inside schools. 
and Karam was actually one of the very early organizations that we started working with. Uh, I know Lena from our MIT days, so it, it kind of made uh, uh, a lot of sense to kind of to try to do something together. There was a lot of synergy between what we are doing and what she and what she wanted to do with with Karam House, and so this is how we how we started working together. And so we're going to show you uh, a film now that kind of capture uh, the, uh, the the kind of the essence, I think, of the program. Let me make sure the sound is. Over the course of eight years, we have almost 12 million Syrians who have lost their home. That is over half of the original population. <laughs> انه بدل ما اطلع العب مع الاولاد في الحاره مثلا فلا كنا نتخبى بالبيوت خوف من الطياره اشتد كثير الضرب لدرجه انه كل سكان الضيعه طلعوا برا الضيعه فضبينا اغراضنا واجت سياره بابا كان شخص يعني صديق له وصلنا على معبر باب الهوى This space is really special because we built it with the intention of being able to make an impact on Syrian refugees' lives. I've been working on the Syrian crisis since 2011, since the Syrian revolution began. How our work developed from being an organization that is reacting to a humanitarian crisis to becoming more and more involved in innovative education and really doing things that we think are extremely important for kids. The energy of the kids here is incredible. You know, we built this space with this idea that uh, we're restoring dignity and it's always our intention to do things with the community and with the kids and the families to be part of our programs. We also create a space where everything is available to them. So kids come in here, they have their reception, they have a library, they can be playing chess, they can be painting, and then they go into their studio spaces. And the studios are really places where they interact with their mentors and they follow a design-based curriculum that we do in partnership with Nubu Studio and that is our um, partner school in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. One of the really amazing things that we do are exchange studios, virtual exchange. It's really interesting to see how we have groups of kids here and groups of American kids either at Nuvu Studio or at a Nuvu Partner School exchange and work together on a design studio. So one of the first ones that we did was a prosthetic studio and we had groups of four kids, um, two American kids, two Syrian kids that worked together to actually design a prosthetic for a real life case um, here in Rehanli. We want kids to be able to realize that yes, you are a refugee, yes, you are a victim of a war, but that doesn't define you. What defines you is what you do. You have a responsibility to do, do good in your community, no matter who you are. And doing this, basically what you see is the kids transform. Sometimes kids can't even express their idea. Sometimes kids can't stand in a classroom in front of their friends and even say their names and talk about their idea or in their even an opinion. And what happens at Kerem House is within a few sessions, they begin to stand up and they explain their idea, they explain their design, they begin to discuss and, um, and talk about ideas. And these things start to happen. And when you do that over and over again, then you're seeing kids walking very confidently, knowing their place in the world. صراحة بتخيل حالي عم بشتغل في وكالة ناسا بما اني انت كثير بهتم في الفضاء وهيك فقبل فترة طالعوا اول صورة للثقب الاسود وصراحة كثير كنت مبسوطة وفرحانة فبتمنى وقت ما اشتغل بوكالة ناسا اقدم شيء مثل اللي قدموه اول المستكشفين للصورة الاولى للثقب الاسود يعني شيء يكون عظيم <تصفيق> Yeah. 
Okay. This is always amazing to see. I've seen this uh, video a million times, but every time I see it, it's like goosebumps. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, Lena, you wanna? Yes, uh, I feel the same way. Actually, I think it's kind of hard to speak after that video. I haven't seen it in a long time. And it's um, it brings me back to pre-COVID days. And I'm hoping that we're going to get to a place close to that soon. Um, my name is Lena Sergi Attar, and I'm the CEO and founder of Kerem Foundation. And um, as I uh, explained, the relationship between Kerem and Nuvu is a very close one. Um, I've known Saeed for many years and we were at, at MIT together and, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's a, I never knew that I was going to be in this place of doing this kind of work, especially when we met at MIT, we were um, Syrian um, architects uh, studying at MIT and kind of not knowing what the future would hold. And, you know, within less than 10 years, uh, the Syrian revolution had began and it became one of the largest humanitarian crises of our lifetime. And I had founded Karam Foundation in 2007, well before the war. Karam means generosity in Arabic. And the way we want to intervene was to help people as well as we could um, in this context of the war that was um, increasing in scale, especially in terms of the numbers of the people that have been displaced as you saw in the film and as you saw it as we work specifically in Turkey right now and you saw Azra's work in Jordan and everybody knows the context of how far the Syrian refugee crisis has spread throughout the years and it is continuous. I think people forget that the war is continuous now and in the internally displaced people inside Syria face a lot of struggle. And I remember when we started, you saw some of the images in the video of the early pre Karam house uh, work that we would do as an organization. We were doing a lot of work um, as mi in missions inside camps. And so I think what made us go towards this kind of work and apply the design studio learning and the kind of uh, learning that I went through in the various places, including MIT, is that uh, I was at my first visit to an IDP camp in to, in the, at the end of 2012. Um, it was Ultimate Camp in Northern Syria. And I think at the time there was about 12,000 um, children in the camp. The camp had over 20,000 refugees that were facing their first winter and living in plastic tents and the situ living situation was miserable. And we were a very small organization. And I remember meeting the head of the camp and I had enough uh, funds with me to spend on that trip. And I asked him what we could do with these funds. And he said, you could do two things. You could do one of two things. You could either um, feed the camp for a day or you could, um, what, we, what we really need is we have only two soccer balls in the whole camp and there's nothing else for the kids to play with and I can't take them out because they there's riots that happen if I take out one soccer ball because they all want to play and I went back to the hotel that night and I made the decision that we delivered over 1000 soccer balls in these huge um, in a couple of trucks because they had to come inflated to the camp and because knowing that we would be able to give them at least a few months of play versus one day of food. And I think that's kind of like where that like seed of work um, emerged. And we wanted to focus on innovation, on creativity. Um, the idea of Kerem House was born from the missions that we did eventually with, you know, dozens of volunteers who did all these creative missions. And when we decided to do Kerem House, we wanted to do focusing on Syrian refugee teenagers, we focused on that age where you can actually make an intervention that would do a 180 degree change with a small amount of time, which you heard in the video, whether it's a girl or a boy's life at that moment in a refugee's life, they either can continue on for a future that is um, they can have agency over when you give them the school, the skills and the opportunities, or they're going to be uh, subjected to a life that's really out of their control and very hard to undo, whether that's early marriage, whether that's lab, um, you know manual labor, or really any kind of future where you felt that you'd had no agency over. 
Um, so at Karam House, they, we implement the Nuvu Karam program. We, uh, we have these studios. They are all run by our team of mentors. I think Ramzi is going to talk about the, how, how the studios are run. And we're very proud that both Karam Houses, we have two, one in Reyhanli, which you saw, which is right on the Syrian border in southern Turkey, and the other in Istanbul. They are run by a majority Syrian refugee um, community. And so it's very important that the things that we do are co-authored with the community for the community. And so much of the work that we do actually is directed with the kids like Batul, who you saw in the video, somebody, a, a young Syrian refugee from Northern Syria and, who dreams of space, of dreams of science. She writes articles um, for, our, for our newsletter and then uh, the internal newspaper that they, that they create at Karam House called Basmatuna. Um, the, and, and these kinds of dreams of Syrian kids actually motivate us to create these studios. Um, as you saw in the video, I love the um, exchange studios that we had. Also pre-COVID, we were doing things that were um, helped us create the virtual studios um, and transition to a virtual space during COVID. And right now we're very excited about reopening this summer and bringing about this energy because one of the most important parts of Kenham House is not necessarily that they have the maker space and the tools and the Wi-Fi and the laptops and this amazing elite curriculum that is usually never, actually is never available um, for a vulnerable refugee community um, like at Karam. That's like the radical part about this program, but it's also this sense of belonging, this sense of creating a future home, this sense of being able to take um, agency of your life and knowing that you'll be able to reach your full potential. So that's what we aspire to do. Our goal is to build 10,000 leaders by 2028 and unleash a future generation of young adults that can solve problems, innovate, work in their host communities and make the world better and uh, make a change in the world despite all of the hardship that they've gone through. Ramzi, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Dino. Um, all right, it's a bit hard to go after all of that, but I get to talk about projects, so that's exciting. I'm, I'm gonna walk through a couple of projects and try to talk about them and then um, we can leave a lot more for the Q&A. Um, so I'll start where we are here. This was um, one of the several virtual exchange studios we did over a time period of two years. Um, we worked, um, or, or the students at Kenham House worked with students um, at uh, Woodstock, at a school, at a public school in Woodstock, Vermont, that New View works with on designing play structures for a playground that Kenham Foundation was building in Turkey. So this is one of the later full-scale prototypes that later went into the playground. Uh, this is a ritual studio where uh, students were analyzing uh, community rituals or cultural traditions that take place and making robots based on that. So we're always trying to kind of draw parallelisms and link the actual culture and the context they're, they're um, living in and adapting to with the projects we're doing. Um, this is a similar one. So this is part of a series of studios that is focused on robotics, but also trying to functionalize a lot of daily life activities. Um, this is one of, one of the more exciting studios as well. So this one was the very first virtual exchange studio we did where students in Florida were working with students in Rehandli and <clears throat> a number of children uh, who needed very specific prosthetics. So a big problem with uh, prosthesis for kids is that they outgrow them very quickly. Um, and we were trying to use technological methods to make it easier to, to build prosthetics that could be remade at very low cost as the kids were, um, were aging. So this is a boot for um, this little girl who had a fracture in the comb of her foot um, and which she was using. Can look here. So this studio ran, it, it was a multi-session studio. So it ran for several months and there was a lot of testing going on with the group. Um, here's, here's an exciting one um, where the kids were really able to geek out and figure out how to actually make a drone fly. So it was also part of a, of a very exciting robotics uh, studio series where students started by understanding th the principles that go into designing a drone all the way to actually making it and testing it out. But we were also thinking of why are we making these things? What are the impacts? And this one specifically was intended to be 
um, used in emergency situations where someone needed resources or needed help during an injury or something like that. Um, and it was a large group of students working on it. Um, finally, this is what we've been dabbling with a little bit more recently. Um, so we've done a series of VR AR studios um, and students are starting to kind of expand into that realm, think about what might that look like and how to, um, what that might look like and how to relate it to daily life. So essentially they're making avatars and building virtual worlds and trying to link them um, with the reality they're in. So here we can see a little bit what's going on. Okay, and I'll wrap up here and leave space for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's take a moment to applaud uh, the fine work, but also the uh, fantastic projects the participants in your programs have produced. Congratulations. Uh, it's, it's, the images are always beautiful. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait for some hands to go up from our uh, audience and see questions in the chat. Uh, I'll start off with one. The work is compelling, it's uh, beautiful, it's functional, it's fanciful, it's personal. Um, and I heard words from all of you like dreams and agency and human rights. Why design-based learning for forcibly displaced people? What, why does this matter? Anyone can take the question, maybe all of you will take it. I can go if I'm um, uh, to talk about that. I think that, um, it comes to the core of our work, why it matters. I think, like I said before, I didn't, I never imagined I would be doing this kind of work um, when I was studying. Um, I studied at in Aleppo and at RISD and then at MIT and didn't imagine the application of this to be in this context. And I think why it matters is because when we went through, and I'm, I'm, we, we're a group of architects here on this panel, and I know that you go through a transformative moment when you're studying architecture um, for most people. And it really is that moment when you realize that you can see the world in a completely different way and that you can actually build um, something in a completely different way. And I know um, Azra, Saeed, and Ramzi are in that camp, and I know a lot of my friends are in that camp of, of thinkers. I mean, um, for Saeed to be, open up an innovation school coming out of a PhD at MIT in a long um, academic uh, career and working in des the design world, people wouldn't think that that would be possible, and why would you do that? And so um, I think that power that I experienced was something that I realized that we could give to um, a young refugee population and give them that power to be able to take agency over their lives in a very specific way. In, um, in a very practical way, what I envisioned and what is coming to reality with the students of Kerem House already, and I thought it would take much longer than this, is that when you're a refugee, I didn't want Syrian refugees or really any refugee or marginalized person to be to have a future based on, the, um, on scarcity, which is how most humanitarian aid actually functions, is that give people a sprinkle, a sprinkle of aid, a sprinkle of shelter, a sprinkle of education, and that's just enough for a refugee. This is a good a job, a job that's good enough for a refugee, and I completely reject that premise. And in real, in the real world, you know, if you want to get a good job, if you want to get a good education, um, you give you have to give people that leg up, and that's how I envisioned with Saeed this idea of flipping that narrative, of um, taking something that is really available here in America, a program like NUVU is really available for the most part for people who can afford that level of education, afford the uh, a very expensive education. What happens when you're able to provide this for free um, to a vulnerable population? Um, you give them the, t the same kinds of tools and then suddenly you have these kids and these young adults that are that have access to careers and access to futures because of the skills that they learn and what and being a refugee no longer is part of the equation. Nobody's going to be getting these jobs or opportunities out of pity. It's going to be because of what be, be because of what they know. And I think that's a superpower that we wanted to give to as many kids as possible. That's so beautiful what you just said, Lena. And I, I'm kind of, um, yeah, just moved by 
uh, your passion, but also really you mentioned the word agency and that's something that is so important. That's something we learned at this camp when, when people are forced to live in a prison that is, you know, <laughs> declared a camp, but it's really a prison uh, where you are deprived of any source of agency. This is what we have learned from these people is that design became a tool to, to actually live, to create something that is worth living when you are not given any reason to live anymore. And that for me was such a, a kind of striking relation. Now, one has to be somehow careful, I think, depending on the context in which one is working, right? It's like inside of the camp, outside is very different situation because they also the, the access to education is so limited and what they can do after. But I think in this kind of prison-like situations, design becomes this uh, vehicle to like transform your life. But also I think um, um, to critique and to kind of defy and to be a sort of protest uh, against the uh, inhuman uh, conditions that uh, uh, people are forced to live in. And I think what also struck me throughout our different conversations, because we all seem to also connect different learners across the globe. I think there is another opportunity. This is what I think we all are doing in, a, in a, one way or the other is to, <clears throat> it's not necessarily design education uh, based education for refugees only, but also about the conditions of war and this forced displacement and so on, because there is another problem uh, related to forced displacement, which is a biased uh, uh, perception of refugees and a kind of dehumanization of the migrant, even not only the, the refugee, but um, people, you know, people are uh, kind of put in a position to be perceived as enemies, as, um, as, a, as a threat, um, and they're politicized in that way. And I think that's another idea where this kind of trans uh, cultural education can be a powerful tool to connect communities across the border and deconstruct those uh, stereotypes and, and fears of the other. Azra, let's talk about that a little bit more because I know that you've made ethics a big piece of the work that you've done and the considerations that go into when you do this type of uh, cross-cultural, cross-border um, projects, particularly when it comes to heritage preservation. Do you want to talk a little bit more about those ethical considerations? Sure. I mean, there are so many dilemmas when one works in this context, right? So what seems to be ethical in one context is not in another. So like, for example, this lamp that we did, you face a dilemma. What happens if suddenly one person would go and make a business out of it? And it's something that the whole community of people has developed together, right? Or um, where, like what Alina mentioned earlier, where do you put the money? Do you pay for the food for one day? Or do you, what impact do you decide on working on, right? For us, it was also this, do I pay for my trips or, and, and trips of my collaborators? Or can I, shall I send the money and support this or that program? So there are so many different dilemmas that are not easily to resolve. And they are also easily to freeze one from doing anything. I remember at the beginning when we, we came to help and just to see how can we even be useful as designers. And this is the kind of skill that we can offer. Very soon we learned, uh, well, actually, you know, it's quite presumption that we are coming and we're gonna help. This was this kind of white savior mode. Uh, I mean, with best intentions. <laughs> But best intentions sometimes, um, you know, as they say in America, uh, you know, good intentions are to help. Um, so we realized that the best way to help would be to, to kind of unlearn and learn from people and not design for the people, but design with the people and kind of try to amplify um, uh, those skills and needs and interests that are already there with the people and, and the kind of use our resources there. But there have been many um, dilemmas, you know, and the way I went around it was to just come to terms that um, it's 
going to be inevitably problematic that you know that what we are doing partly is you know the world is unfair place let's say just the fact that we were able to enter and leave the camp and they cannot is already a very problematic thing but then shall that prevent you from doing anything right so are there ways in which i could use my institutions and the fact that i can come in and out this is not to justify the existence of camps and embrace it, but can I use my skills and my institution and that privilege to kind of subvert that? And that's, I think, where we are hoping to place, but also, again, with the ethics, code of, who defines the ethics? First, we thought, okay, we are going to kind of create a code for the entire collaboration. Then it became very interesting that this is not going to happen and who are we to define the ethics for everyone else. Right? So we were just able to define the position for ourselves and be transparent to everyone you know, when working with it. Uh, but um, where most um, benefit of that kind of thinking was to bring different cultural and disciplinary perspectives together for people to share the dilemma. So, you know, for a journalist, it might be ethical to take pictures of the kids, but for an artist doing artwork about it and maybe selling that artwork, is, is it, right? Are you, what are you showing? Are you showing people? Or are you showing the artworks? So um, these are really problematic things, right? How do you prevent exploitation? How do you prevent doing harm? Um, and how do you take yourself out while still also, you know, promoting the cause and and uh, educating people about the issues. So uh, it was important to have these honest conversations and, and put people in relation to one another and, you know, ask yourself these difficult questions. What exactly are you contributing? And so this, and it's not easy. It's basically, you have to admit that you always have one foot in the dirt when working in this kind of context. I, I want to follow. Sorry, Sorry if I can just no, no, go ahead. I was, I was about to call you out. She's interested. Go on, go on. Now I was asking just Ezra about like how often do you kind of need to keep yourself in check as you? Uh, it's, I, I can see that the dilemma is like every every move you you can make there, it it will evoke a, a lot of different feelings and emotions and stuff. And uh, you know, mm -hmm. at some point, yeah, it's better to do something and not be paralyzed by it. But then. Uh, like do at some point, okay, let me just put this on the shelf so I can do the work and, and be productive or like, and how often do you bring that back into your kind of mindset? Okay, let me kind of rethink that as I am doing the work. It's really hard. I mean, I'm just trying to, yeah. to figure out how you navigate all of that. With every step, basically. So we, that's why it took forever to do this book because it was okay. We want to be rediscovered on these amazing inventions. We want to learn from them because this is already what people are designing yes we're designers maybe we could do these things better mm. should we right first like shift of perspective second who's gonna take the pictures am i gonna mm. go around and mm. so the size people or how do we design and so we designed the process so it was about photo workshop with the youth groups they have their own journal team so I can use my art students who have some photo skills and, uh, you know, and then Jordanian groups who actually are excellent designers, but also kind of navigate between different worlds because they also, everyone was totally well. So it was then this joint group that was taking pictures together. This guy knows mm -hmm. photography, this guy knows everyone in the camp. This woman um, knows really like the questions on a kind of subtleties of interviewing people. So there were workshops around that. Then interviews. How do you, we had the photos, okay, how do we create stories about them? So, I don't know, who was gonna do that? So we then did creative writing workshops mm -hmm. on how do you write the story? How do you ask questions? But then once we got the interviews, we realized, uh, and again, youth, uh, youth uh, groups that um, the other journal team was doing the interviews but then it became clear like oops we don't want to put people in danger because mm. they are actually doing something that's forbidden by the mm. uh, you know, international agencies and and the camp regulations so we need to disguise the whole thing so let's do a workshop on 
transforming these stories into fables and disguising. So then the result was quite a weird type of stories because we had to, you know, um, anonymize things. But it was also yeah. important for the students to think about these things. Yeah. You know, not just mm -hmm. like naively talk about stuff or expose people mm -hmm. on the so there is like every step was an issue right and then um, that had to be designed and i think it's really interesting to design that process but that it takes forever but it made it then really meaningful and i think uh, good uh, everyone got a, a certain lesson from it let's say in mm -hmm. caution mm -hmm. There's a, there's a couple of questions in the chat. And of course, if anybody wants to raise their hands and ask the question to the panelists, we'd like to hear more voices too. Uh, Lana asks, uh, how do you see design-based learning connected to workforce development? Have you worked or seen examples of connecting your educational programs to workforce and exposing children to vocational or career pathways? Yeah, th this is a really interesting kind of uh, question. If I, I will start, someone can, can jump in later. But it's it, uh, you know even here in 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 the U.S., we've been uh, kind of dealing with this issue a lot because in general, the assumption here is that if you go to high school, that you will have to go to college after, and there is not necessarily kind of this career path that might take you to other places, and and so. Uh, you know, but we we think that the, the type of model that we have should should easily kind of cater either to the to the to the college route or to kind of um, uh, to, to going to the to the workforce right away. And and we are just now like after doing this for ten years, we're we're starting to see some examples of students where uh, sometimes they go to college for a semester or two, and then they decide it's like they have all the skills to be able to be productive members of, of this uh, of the society so they go and interns uh, and they, they are very skilled so they find internships and that turns into full-time positions and basically at age 20 21 they have really amazing jobs so uh, it's it's uh, th th that story is it, it's kind of beginning to, to, to change a little bit but uh, you know that being said I think this model that we have is is it, it lends itself like so much better to 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 kind of in some ways to workforce development it's just like they are learning all the skills they are getting all this creative confidence to kind of take on whatever problems and uh, and in some ways it's, it really simulates what happens in the real world because in the real world you are not just like given an engineering problem and you are sitting in a corner and you're trying to work on it by yourself it's it's a it's a lot more collaborative uh, you know you need a lot of the skills that you basically learn at the studio so so we feel like a lot of our students who uh, get you know our students tend to get a lot of internships during the summer when when they go to these places in the summer they do really amazing work because they 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 have been doing this for for a long time and it feels like an easy transition for them yeah i can i can build on that a bit but i also want to link to the earlier comments i like what azra was saying about the ethics and kind of going into a community and thinking of how to structure the learning experience and i and i think at the core of what New View does, we we don't have answers. I think that's like a very essential principle. We're we're not coming in and saying this is the answer, and you have a few weeks to figure it out. We're saying this is an issue. Let's figure out what the questions are, and then let's look at possible answers. And I think doing that um, with the kids in Rehandi first, in Istanbul as well, and and in some other places also has been very interesting because it obviously is surprising, right? The perspective I personally might have of what a project is gonna be is, yeah. is almost never going to align with anyone else and let alone kind of the disparity in context and environments. But it's it's also humbling because you actually learn you don't know anything about that context. You're, you're basically just facilitating. I think that's what we do. Um, and over the years, we've seen a wide range of projects where students go out, they have uh, we saw it in some examples, a really heavy impact on the community that, that we couldn't design ourselves. They have an understanding on how to work with the people around them that they didn't know they had, but the process facilitated and they were able to tap into that and create that impact. Um, and I think also we've seen students go on beyond the program to impact their communities, whether it's in the work they choose to do, whether it's going and teaching what they learn at Kerem House at their schools or to their colleagues. 
um, or, or, you know, a range of self-driven projects. You have students creating their own NFTs now, things that like we still don't fully understand how to do. So, so there's, there's a very interesting realm over there. And, and how that links to kind of what, what the job market looks at or, you know, what, what happens after high school education. Um, of course, we do have kids that go to colleges and, and we do have kids that end up working. We have maybe close to 100 graduates or a bit more now from, from the current programs, um, all of whom are doing you know, really amazing things. Uh, but, but the skills they have situate them, whether they go on to college or to the workforce in a place that the average 17, 18 year old is just not in. Um, sometimes the feedback we hear is they go in and their first year of, uh, of university is easy. You know, they, they know all of the foundational skills that are being learned, or they're, they've already experimented with tools and methods that are being taught much later. Similarly, in, in the workforce, there's a lot of, you know, there's the collaboration, there's a lot of skills that, that today you have to learn when you start a job, whatever your age is, that some of these kids are learning when they're 15 already, and getting comfortable and comfortable, more and more comfortable with over, um, over the years. Um, I, I think it's, it's specifically for... Um, the Karam program, it's it's hard to have kind of a blanket kind of evaluation of of how this program affects the next steps because it's it's also very diverse and there's a lot of personal conditions from like citizenship status to students who are economically able to travel lo locally or internationally or not. So we, we see a lot, but I, I think at the core, we, we see a lot of transformation in, in the attitude and vision of students. And, and the most important thing <sighs> This is what I often say when I'm when I'm talking about the program is they, they shift their mindset to something is wrong in the community I'm in to, oh, there's something I could potentially make better. I can't change everything, but I can start with this little thing. I'll take small steps and that kind of can create enough momentum to see uh, um, to see change. And, and again, we're, we're facilitating that, but they're actually doing the action. We'd love to address that question, but maybe show one more project that um, kind of talks about it, if I may. Um, because, like, so this is a project we uh, developed, um, you know, in the Zatari camp to try to insert ourselves in vocational training education, uh, where, you know, you have. Uh, NRC is doing this wonderful program for like vocational training or training people to kind of do some sewing, also do some kind of startups and so on. But, you know, people find themselves by sewing things like for Jordanian military. I mean, it's uh, like, where is that education um, going for? And so we thought one possibility might be that we uh, hack into that vocational training system and again, insert design-based education that would be also informed by critical thinking, but also uh, some uh, items of heritage. Uh, so here, you know, we came up with this project called TSERA. It's on the one hand, an exhibition piece that talks about these issues, but it's actually a kind of pedagogy around it that, that inserted itself into the NRC um, programs. And so it's a, it's a tent made out of recycled clothing and it's basically a hybrid of these tea shelters, the ready-made shelter, and the Ottoman military palace that used to be these elaborate palaces made of applique technique. And what the project does was to explore the potential of that very inadequate humanitarian aid system that is basically sending uh, trash clothing to as partly also totally culturally inappropriate clothing as a donation to the camp. So how can one see this trash uh, and trash also that is a result of one of the most lucrative and most polluting industries in the world, the textile industry, to transform it as a sort of a livelihood uh, opportunity mm -hmm. uh, uh, to transform the misery into an opportunity. Uh, so uh, you see here, you know, we tested it both aesthetically, but also in, ter in terms of thermal insulation. So uh, tight jeans with shock blankets layered with uh, wool blankets uh, layered into tapestries to form a sort of uh, kayamia like this inspired by uh, traditional Middle Eastern um, 
tent structures. And you see some items of clothing, like we purposely left it visible so you can, like the baby <laughs> suit and the shirt and so on. But so there are possibilities of these modular tapestries to, on the one hand, you can use them for insulation uh, and decoration and transforming visually your living environment. You could also use them to create a kind of a social spaces. And, um, but then it's a pedagogical format. So we did workshops in MIT, in Sharjah, uh, and in Zatari camp. And in, depending on with which communities in Sharjah, it was a lot of actually Palestinian um, uh, migrants living in the Emirates. At MIT, it was like students from all around the world. And in Zatari, it was uh, women and youth um, groups enrolled in the vocational training program where they learn how to sew for, to become, you know, cheap labor for the textile market. And here the idea was to say, okay, can you learn these techniques to also subvert that system and then learn how to express yourself? We, we know from art practices that you can use textiles to you know, tell stories, preserve, uh, preserve your uh, histories, but also, uh, you know, communicate political messages. And this is what happened with the students, uh, this incredible kind of array of expression. So I see a great opportunity in these kinds of projects. Now the question is how does one scale it up and it would it be possible to have a system where really instead of, you know, buying, humanitarian aid from Switzerland and importing it to Jordan, can you uh, transform this idea also the labor market and the very limited uh, training that camp residents receive and that they are geared de facto into forced uh, work camps to transform it to something that would, they would be producing their own aid and also learning a skill for uh, future and even maybe towards a certain livelihood projects. So I wanted to just put this up as a kind of provocation for thinking, but um, you know, vocational training is great, but the question is also always <laughs> the political, what can they do with that education? Mm -hmm. You know, in case of, um, in all countries you have limitations on what refugees can actually do with the, with, uh, with the education. You know? So that's another issue we, I think, maybe cannot necessarily deal with with design-based education, but to keep in mind, where is that feeding to, right? Um, I, I think that's a great point, Ezra. And and the the summit is about education and pathways to, to learning. Karam, Lena, calibrates different. We Karam talks about 10,000 leaders, which takes a very broad view. Do you want to talk about how you see innovative education getting to 10,000 leaders and what the role is for displaced people with that goal? I'm sure. And I also wanted to talk, I saw in the chat, there was a question that was related to trauma um, and yes. how, how this is, um, how this work connects to that. And um, I think that's one of the things that a lot of people ask about, you know, how does this kind of work or this approach um, fit in with the um, experiences of Syrian refugees uh, who have experienced mass displacement, a lot of them have witnessed uh, violence, have been victims of violence themselves. Um, I think in terms of our context in Turkey, but I think that's probably across the board. Um, there's probably almost no Syrian refugees who have not been exposed to some sort of bullying and discrimination in their host communities. So this is, so we deal with populations that are very traumatized and, uh, and it's a very difficult space. What Kerem House does, um, in the in providing a safe space for kids to be together, for the community to gather, um, for even the technology and the maker space, the act of making itself, the act of designing and being in that creative mode. What we learned is that actually pushes people, anybody who does this, it pushes you actually into the present moment. It is a way of forcing this sense of a meditative space that actually helps you heal from your trauma through making 
This is something I also didn't know before going into this work, and through and and it is a it is, that becomes a part of the bringing the kids in and having them wanting to do this work and the sense of belonging, the sense of home away from home, is as important as all of the other pieces that we bring in. And together they begin to actually create what Said was talking about those that creative confidence that helps them go into the future. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of leadership, I mean, just the fact of calling something that for us, the using the term leader was a very specific uh, deliberate choice. I know because, you know, we, we, we see a lot of leadership books and it's very much in, you know, the business world here as well as, you know, the tech world. But the but for us as Syrians, taking this word leader is um, is really um you know, reappropriating a word that was stolen from the Syrian people. Um, it's a it's a political decision and a and a revolutionary decision. And as I mentioned, protest. Um, this is about claiming and reclaiming our freedom of thought. And because in Syria, when you're growing up, there's one leader, one picture, one family. It's still the same. And, and you're not allowed to even imagine yourself as having a space of leadership, of choice, of freedom. And, and so for us to say we're creating 10,000 leaders, it really is in that sense of the term of people that can actually engage in the community wherever they are and, and take ownership and agency over their lives and actually be able to say, I want to make change. I can make change, I'm capable. And so that's why we call them future leaders. And uh, and we instill in them the sense of giving back and the sense of generosity, which is the essence of Karam, because that's also really important to make sure that this work continues beyond themselves. And, uh, and it is this revolutionary idea that we can't end the war, but we can shape the future through this work and it can scale in that way. And we have a very deep belief in that uh, for the future. I'm watching for more questions from the audience and uh, and in the chat. So feel free to raise hands or, or, or type away. Um, how, how do you how do you assess in, in your work uh, progress accomplishment? How do you how do you judge that uh, output? Of course, the visuals are beautiful, but what are what are the steps that you look at when you're working with uh, people in the camps or for students in the community in Turkey. Ramzi is our data person, so he can talk about that. I also wanted to give a shout out in the uh, re, right here in the group. We have a few of our mentors and people from the Kadam team from Turkey joining in. So hi, everybody. Um, Ramzi can talk about um, how we measure things. Well, one of them can Anne, talk about their experience, but Ramzi, please. Um, yeah, I, I will try. Um, but of course, this is this is very complex. Um, we, we we try not to kind of evaluate just numerically, but at the same time, you need kind of different layers of data to understand um, the impact. But I think I'll link it back to what you were saying earlier, Lena, about what it means to be a leader. And I think there's like a fundamental change in, in the understanding of the term with what we do, because at Kerem House, leadership is like, it's not something bestowed upon you or that you're born with. It, it's linked to action. So if you do something, then you you kind of can consider yourself a leader. And, and I think without explicitly talking about what leadership is, we have been to, to a pretty decent extent, been able to transform the understanding of the term with students and encourage them to kind of take that initiative within their communities and in their settings. Um, so I think that's pretty amazing. And, that, and that's, a for me, at least a very easy way to look at what the students are doing whether it's in their projects or after they leave Kadam House or in their personal lives and think, okay, this is definitely a way to say there is impact and there is success. Um, on, on the kind of more boring to most people, exciting to me side with the data, we, we do, we, New View has I touched on this a bit, an, an evaluation system. We try not to grade. We, we, use, we use different metrics. We look at different um, things altogether than what the traditional schooling system would look at or, um, or it's, it's just there's nothing traditional there. Um, so there is a set of skills. We do evaluate these from one studio to, to the other. They can change depending on what the studio is. But in general, the idea is we try to track improvement and we try to identify areas of growth for students and capitalize on, uh, you know, on those areas um, to, to help them kind of uh, make a leap in, in, uh, in future studios. Um, we see a lot of uh, 
we, we see a lot of instability, I think, and it's linked to students who, who are not consistently in the program for, for a wide variety of reasons. So that is kind of something we observe. They leave for, for a session or for a semester or two, they come back, there's like a small reset, then there's another push. Um, but in general, the trend for in most cases does move in a, in a positive way. This becomes much less significant when you compare it to like the personal stories um, we hear from students. Usually we have meetings with students who are graduating and they talk about their experiences. And I remember, I think this was the first one a few years ago, um, and I was at Karam House and we had a gathering um, and Rehandi and, and students were talking about their experience. And one of the students said that um, they had walked in on the first day and they said zero words. They couldn't even say their name out loud, literally. And by the end of the experience, I mean, they were almost just like running that discussion, um, which is which is something amazing to see because I like I'm skeptical that you can teach that in a very linear way. Right. But it's exposing the student to all of these experiences, putting them in this environment with their colleagues that they're able to transform it. And this is a very common one. I mean, when students really struggle to present their work and at the end, after just two years, they become extremely outspoken. They become confident in what they're saying. They become much more resilient to criticism and harsh feedback. Um, I think all of these are things that are very hard to measure. We, we try to do it, but it's, it's never going to be perfect. Um, but, you know, in, in my mind, the hope is in 10 years, you see this impact very directly on, on the community and, um, you know, it, be, it becomes self-evident. But it's a really tricky uh subject actually because um, and you guys have a different scale of operations that we had we came also in as an artist right to um, by using interrogative design methods to something so we had to prove some numbers to some funders uh, usually what i've seen from the ngos they're all basically uh, you know it's quantity of people how many people come in and, and very soon i realized that there is a whole inflation in this key performance indicators because the NGOs pay the people to come to do the, ref, uh, the workshops. So all of our workshops were paid uh, through the facilitating NGOs. And for them, it's a way of disseminating aid, of course, uh, because they cannot just like give out direct cash. But so you don't really know is the person just coming to your workshop because they're getting paid or not. And, and then the NGOs are battling with each other because I mean, of all of them, <laughs> uh, okay, I will not name names, but you know, one is paying more than the other that everyone is going to those workshops. So it's quite interesting what the, the system does actually to education too, and it spoils the whole motivation for why do you want to do a thing. But this is how the system is set up and it's at least in the camp and it's the only way how you can kind of give people the money. Um, so I didn't take those numbers at all as measurable sort of success. What was interesting and, and it was to just kind of see and get personal feedback from people and see the transformation in the group that was happening. So from uh, one man who was uh, you know, participating was fully depressed and traumatized, obviously, and kind of came there to help a little bit with the engineering part of that lamp. And then suddenly we discover that he knows calligraphy and he's doing this and then his lights uh, eyes start lighting up and you kind of see a transformation in this person who suddenly is like teaching the kids and everyone is getting excited wonderful right or or kids who were in some of these because of our group worked together over years when we saw them grow up and actually from beginnings when we could barely communicate where they actually learn english over youtube and through these interactions to then many of them wanting to study architecture and design because they were inspired by members of the group there. Or women, you know, who were, so to say, too, uh, too over the age of marriage, but then um, didn't want to kind of stop their life. And then they suddenly they get inspired by all these international women who actually have engineering degrees and want to study engineering because that's suddenly a possibility for a woman. So I think there is a lot of that impact that is kind of unmeasurable in a way. I mean, you can see it in a long term and I'm not sure what's the best way of documenting that because it is important, of course, you want to prove the validity of your work and especially if you have a long um, term running organization. But some of it is really 
you know, not so easily measurable because it's like, um, and plus you, you kind of, yeah, don't want to, to monetize the, the story immediately. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky subject, but I think certain maybe feedback following the workshops and uh, kind of sharing experiences and getting that feedback as we do in our classes as well is one possibility to, to go about it. I completely agree with you, Esther. It's so hard to talk about measuring impact in the concrete way. And I think we get a lot of um, criticism, you know, when you want to run grants and you want to report back and the stories that you say we have, there's so many stories of impact. And I don't think that the impact of this kind of work can be clear until many years from now. I mean, I want, I even, I mean, I, if I take my own self as an example of, um, of how long it takes from the point of ed, like getting your education and having those light bulb moments to the moment of actually creating impact in the world. And suddenly you want to give kids, um, you know, teenagers that have been going through this, ex this extreme experience, you know, one semester, two semesters, or even two years of what we have of studios and then say like, this is the impact. No, I imagine the impact is really 10, 15 years from now to really go in and see what people do and what they do with this education and how they, how they create their own impact in the world. Well, I think we have about six minutes left. I get the, the feeling that we're always kind of in design mode when we're talking about this kind of work. Let's talk about the future. What's, what's on your mind? Uh, what are you designing next? What are you thinking about? What are the challenges you want to tackle next? It's too secret, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Said, you're on mute. Said, no, I mean it's. I think everybody is signed because it's it's it's. Uh, there's too much usually. That's why people are, you know. I think for us, you know, with the with the work that we do here in Cambridge and uh, with the work that we do all over the world, it just uh, you know the goal is always how to make the work better and and uh, you know we already see kind of you know everybody talked about the transformational impact that this type of education can have on 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 students and kids everywhere and and so uh, we are kind of focused on that mission and then try to take it to uh, as as kind of many places as we can but i think as we are like uh, emerging I mean, it, this is debatable whether we are getting out of uh, emerging out of the pandemic or not. But I, I feel like there is a lot of that energy coming back, even with the, with the, with Karam and and the and, and the work that we do with them. When we talk about exchange studios, when we talk about a lot of these things, and just how do we kind of bring that uh, kind of uh, creative energy back across across the rest of the network for us? So it's it's a uh, uh, it. it it's you know it's it's been really difficult the last two years, but it's it's all like you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and it's 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 presenting a lot of really uh, exciting opportunities for us to kind of move the the the, the work uh, further than we've ever done before. Well, class is now is uh, we have to uh, launch finally this uh, now that the book is out the online course uh, that is based also on the inventions and try to kind of scale that up and disseminate. We haven't been able to access the camp because of COVID. So I don't know how that will work with the creation of a book launch there. I mean, the access is always an issue. What is possible, but personally, I also I would like to develop further this the, the tent project because you know, it's a kind of proof of concept of what this can do as a pedagogy, but also potentially as a, as a humanitarian product that could be then made by people and then linked to the education. Um, and if there is a possibility to actually implement that on a larger scale, that would be fantastic. We managed to implement the masks uh, during the COVID period, like just started producing this like how do you make masks for COVID without anything? Um, so it was very interesting with our group of students across all MIT actually, but also our collaborators in Jordan have translated the instructions in Arabic and then 
kind of disseminated it in the camp. And then we worked with CARE, who then actually pushed the, these masks through the Ministry of Health to get permission to like, scale them up and like commission people to produce them. So it's possible actually to do these projects on a, on a kind of larger scale. So I see the, the potential there. And you know, if uh, you know, refugees themselves could be involved, in that I think that would be a, a major shift in the way humanitarian materials and aid is circulating because uh, I think it would kind of destabilize the economy of uh, this dependency model that is also standing in the way of verification too. Ramzi, do you Lina, want to... I was going to say, who wants the final word here? Ramzi, why don't you talk about what's coming up next? Okay, why am I getting all the hard questions? <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, I can, for me, I'll say how I think of it personally. I, I think we're setting a lot of precedent with what we're doing, and I think about that a lot. So whether it's on the New View side, looking at now like hundreds and thousands of schools are setting up STEM and STEAM and, and maker programs and makerspaces and all of this stuff. And how I think about our work there is, we're in a critical position to make sure this doesn't like go in a non-productive way or we don't miss like this shift to actually transform the educational system. Um, and it's it's somewhat similar for Karam. Like there's there's no end to these crises. That's the sad reality of the world. And you know, we're getting more every year and every month and every week. And I think we are setting a a precedent that's very strong for like dealing with these difficulties with dignity and not you know not with arrogance or not with looking down or not with knowing the right answer um so i really think how we think about a lot of this work has the potential to define how these issues are tackled um the, the pr pressure is figuring out how to you know make sure you're in the right place at the right time make sure the um the impact is resonating um, and it's not just us transferring it one layer, but it's going multiple layers beyond that with students transferring this knowledge to colleagues and friends and um, and so on. Thank you. I, I think shortly we're going to see the link to the uh, Discord channel and we're going to be sharing uh, the video in the days to come, the link to the uh, Azra's book, as well as uh, the Karam Nouveau video and gallery will be there as well. Uh, it's in the chat. You might be able to copy and paste it if you're really fast. Thank you for joining us this morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you are. I wish you good health and a successful rest of the week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of the summit. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dimitri. Yeah.